we are continuing in our, our conversation from our theme this year, and our theme is centered around a concept of not a New Year's resolution, but more of a New Year's revolution. And our revolution is simply one thought. And that one singular thought is we've gone as far as we can go in the flesh. Now we spent several, several uh, weeks looking at types and patterns in the Old Testament and looking at Amalek. And from looking at Amalek, we were able to distinguish some spiritual types and patterns um, of how the flesh operates in our lives. And we discovered, number one, that our flesh is our greatest enemy. We discovered that God's one goal for our flesh, one goal for our flesh, is to kill it. We learned that our flesh will always cause you and I to walk by sight and not by faith. Uh, we discovered that when we are complaining, mumbling, and grumbling, all we are doing is empowering our flesh. And we discovered that our flesh always seeks to bring us into bondage and slavery. And that our flesh will always rob us of our hearts. Uh, so today we want to understand some strategies for dealing with our flesh. How can we gain victory over our flesh? Galatians chapter 6 verse 8 says, Whoever sows to please their flesh, from their flesh will reap destruction. And whoever sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. So we have to understand strategies so that we are reaping from the Spirit and not sowing into our flesh. Romans 8 5 6 says this, Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. So we see that there's a paradox. And it's kind of like the okie doke if you will, of the Christian life. Because we get saved, we get born again, and we think that somehow, at that moment of conversion, we are completely delivered from the desires and the passions of our flesh. But just like when God moved Israel into the promised land, there were still tribes that Israel had to conquer and overcome. You and I, when we move into our promised land, there are still things that we have to fight, still things that we have to overcome. So today we want to understand some specific strategies. So let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, that the entrance of thy word brings light. Holy Spirit, that you would quicken and enable me to be an effective communicator and translator of your voice and your heart to your people. Lord, we come against everything that would cloud our minds, that would distract our attention, that would weight our hearts. We release the spirit of liberty. We pray, Father, that in the hearing of your word, we embrace conviction, but we reject condemnation. Because, Lord, we know that you are for us and you are not against us. So draw us closer to you, Lord. May this instruction, may this edification Draw our hearts closely to your throne of grace where we can find mercy and grace to help us in our time of need. So Romans 8, 7 tells us this. Romans 8, 7 tells us this. It says, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Cannot please God. It's impossible for you and I, if we are living in our flesh, out of our flesh, to be able to please God. Galatians 5.16, I just want to lay a quick, quick foundation here. Galatians 5.16 says, So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desire <coughs> of the flesh. Here's what I want us to understand. Here's what is important for us to understand. When we say flesh, when we talk about flesh, here's what you and I are talking about. We are talking about our physical, carnal nature. And its willingness and desire to do whatever it wants, when it wants, how it wants, to satisfy, to satisfy its needs and desires. So, understand this. Everything that your flesh, your carnal nature, desires and craves, God gave it that desire. God gave it that desire. Here, the scripture talks about that we would not gratify the desires of the flesh. Some of your translation says the lust of the flesh. Now, here's the Dave Jones definition of lust. 
Because usually when we think of lust, we think of sex, we think of sensuality. Lust is when you and I, in our flesh, when our flesh craves and desires a way to meet a God-given need in a way outside of what God has prescribed. Say that again. Lust, the desires of the flesh, is nothing more than your flesh, our carnal nature, trying to fulfill a desire that God gave him. So God gave us a desire for relationship, right? But when I try to fulfill that desire outside of a means by which God has described, it becomes lust. It becomes sin. God gave us the desire for wanting to be valued. But when I try to fulfill that desire of being valued outside the way God prescribed, and the way God prescribed the way to being valued is I find my value in Him. But when I try to find my value in you and things, now that is a lust. I'm trying to fulfill a desire God gave me, but I'm using ungodly ways to do it. That is the battle with our flesh. Trying to fulfill desires that are in us. But we're trying to do it in ways in which God has not prescribed. And the scripture said the only way we can combat that is that we have to walk by the Spirit. Galatians 5.24 says, And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lust. Yeah. This is the challenge of the Christian life. For you and I to learn to crucify, put to death our flesh daily. Yeah. It doesn't happen one time. In my, years as, in my years as a Christian, one of the things, this is, um, this is me. Don't take this as body. Okay? <coughs> This is, just, this is just me, right? This is me. One of the things that I always um, have a hesitation around, with like the whole altar call thing, when people come to hand they want, is this expectation that I'm going to come up, yeah. somebody's going to lay something on me, and then whatever I'm struggling with, whatever I'm wrestling with, is going to be gone, and I never have to deal with it no more. Yeah. It's that false illusion. Yeah. Every day, you and I are faced with a <coughs> challenge the battle and the task of how do I overcome? How do I gain victory today with my flesh trying to fulfill God-given desires in ungodly ways? That's the challenge for us every day as a Christian. Every day, you and I have to bring our flesh, our carnal nature, trying to fulfill its desires that were given by God yeah. in ways that God has not Prescribed. So, here's some strategies that we're going to get into. Here's some strategies. First strategy we have to understand is we got to bring the right weapon to the fight. Mm -hmm. If we're going to overcome my flesh, if I'm going to get victory, if I'm going to win this daily battle, I have to realize I have to bring the right weapon to the fight. I know y'all say still sanctified filled with the Holy Ghost. It's been a long time since some of y'all been in a street fight, but if you can think back in the day, I remember come, I, I, I remember bringing fist to a knife fight, wound up a Sacred Heart Hospital. It didn't turn out too good. You see in the movies all the time, you know the bad guy will pull out, will pull out a, a, a knife or something, and the good guy will pull out a gun and say, "Oh wow, you brought a knife to a gunfight." You have to have the right weapon. Now. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 4. <coughs> 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 4. Here's what it reads. It says, for the weapons of our warfare. Because yeah. friends, we are in yeah. a war. Yeah. It's a battle. Yeah. Daily. Make no bones about it. The battle is not those outside. The battle is within. When you brushed your teeth this morning, you looked in the mirror, you saw your greatest enemy. You saw your greatest threat to everything that God has ever spoken or promised or whispered in your heart about the direction of your life. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. In other words, they're not of the flesh. They're not of man. The weapons we fight with are not of man. But they are mighty through God to pulling down the strongholds, casting down imagination and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity... Every thought 
to the obedience of Christ. Bringing into captivity every thought. Because the foothold that our flesh tries to grab to get entrance into our heart, to fulfill its desires outside of the way in which God has prescribed begins with the thought. It all starts up here. And what we have to realize is the weapon that God has provided, the weapons God has provided for us are not natural. Your education ain't going to help you. Your money ain't going to help you. Your influence in your relationships are not going to help you. They are not the weapons that you can use to successfully fight this battle. So what is the weapon then? We have to learn to engraft the word of God. We have to learn to engraft the word of God. Look at John chapter 6 verse 63. It is the spirit that gives life. While the flesh is of no avail. Some of your translations may say it profits nothing. The flesh is of no avail. Jesus says the words I have spoken to you are what? Spirit. If we are going to live in the spirit. Walk in the spirit. If we are going to partake of the Zoe. The kingdom life. The entrance and the means and the vehicle to be able to do that. Is in grafting the word of God. You remember when we looked at Amalek in the Old Testament. And when Moses was standing up on the hill with the rod in his hand, and Joshua was down in the back, down in the valley, battling with Emily. <coughs> and as long as Moses held up that rod, which symbolized the word of God, what happened down in the battlefield? Yeah. Joshua prevailed over Amalek. But as soon as Moses let that let, let his arms down, as soon as Moses let that word down, that word was no longer held up over the people, what happened? Amalek prevailed. Listen, you and I. Cannot win this battle, this daily, constant, ongoing assault of the flesh without getting that word engrafted. Now, what do we mean by engrafted? What do we mean by engrafted? It means not just that we know it up here, but that it becomes a part of our living being. It becomes a part of our heart. The scripture says this, God's word is alive and it's active. It's sharpened it in two and sword. It divides asunder both soul and spirit. Now watch this. And it pierces to the joint and marrow of the bone. Yeah. And is a discerner of the very thoughts and intents of our heart. Now when that scripture was written, they didn't know nothing about bone marrow. Bone marrow was just something they knew made soup taste good. <laughs> but what does bone marrow do? It produces the blood. Jesus said that the life of the flesh is in the blood. The scripture says, thy word is life and health to all of my flesh. And grafting the word means that I meditate on the word. It means that I focus and I concentrate on the word. That I'm not just reading and studying the word to be able to run my mouth to somebody else about what I know. It means that I am strategically, purposefully, and intentionally Placing that word in my heart in such a way that I have the ability to deploy it as a strategic weapon when the flesh rises up against me. So if I know that I have certain struggles in this area, then I know to go to the word and to find out what God said about that area. And then to take that word and begin to meditate on it. Begin to memorize it. Take those portions of scriptures and write it on a three by, three by five card, a little post-it note. Somewhere that I know I can have access to it all day long. And now I'm just, I'm just memorizing. I'm just meditating on it. Because what does the scripture say? Blessed is the man who walketh not in the way of their God, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is what? In the law of the Lord. Now how do we know you really delight in the law of the Lord? Because on that law, what does he do? He does it. Meditate on Sunday mornings. Morning devotions. <clears throat> nope, my favorite show was on TBN. No, on that law, he does meditate both day and night. God told Joshua, Joshua, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. But what should you do with it, Joshua? Well, you should meditate on it. How long, Josh? Both day and night. Why? For then you shall make your way successful. That word, getting that word down, word. listen, if you hiccup, you hiccup and bop. You hiccup, you hiccup 
about it. You start filtering, seeing everything through by. That's when you know that word has been engrafted. That's what Peter meant when Peter said, receive with meekness the engrafted word. Watch this. The engrafted word, which is able to save your soul. He said the only word that can save your soul, the only word that can be a weapon to defend your mind, your will, and your emotions from the assault of your flesh is the word that's engrafted. Somebody once said this, the only Bible you and I ever really have, it ain't the Bible sitting on your lap. It's the Bible engrafted in your heart. If we're going to overcome our flesh, if we're going to gain victory in this daily battle, it begins with engrafting that word. As long as Moses held that word up, they prevailed. I can, I, I can tell you right now, whatever area you're struggling in, Whatever area you're hard, having a hard time finding sustained victory in is the area where the word has not been applied. It's the area where you've tried to make the weapon of your warfare what was carnal. You tried your discipline. I'm going to be disciplined. I'm going to be focused. It was part of your New Year's resolution. I ain't going to do it no more. Didn't last long, did it? <laughs> Because listen, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. Principalities and powers. And those principalities and powers try to influence our flesh. Try to empower our flesh through our thought process. But if you have that word engrafted in your mind, you have that word as a defense and a shield in your heart. The scripture says this, when the enemy comes in like a flood. Have you been overwhelmed by the enemy from time to time? I won't tell you shape that when the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord does what? He raises up a standard. Well, what's the standard? The barrier, the defense, the wall. It's the word. See, that's why he'll let you go to church. He'll let you shout. Just don't get no word. That's why so many of us as Christians, we live defeated lives. That's why our churches can be full and the people living in defeat. Because there's no capacity to take hold of a weapon that God has given us for our warfare. Amen. So it begins with the grafting the word. Remember the promise books that we handed out? Yeah. We're going to be handing some more of those out. Like between. We're going to show you how, what to specifically do with those. But what, here's what I want to encourage you to do as we think about this. What is your greatest battle and struggle with your flesh? <clears throat> your greatest battle and struggle you know, the one you've been real good at the last couple of years, high. That secret warfare. You got that, you, 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 you got that black ops battle going on. You got it under cover. On your ops. Everybody knows you've been hiding real good, but it's killing you. You get tired of it. You get tired of faking the fun. You can get victory over that. You can get sustained, lasting, real. I'm not talking that spiritual hype victory. Yeah. I'm talking about real lasting, sustaining victory. If you just make one commitment, that's the commitment of your heart to that word. And again, finding out what does God say about that area. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, and, and I, I share this story a lot in the Thursday night Bible study. How, when I got born again, um, I'd gotten high from the time I was 11 until 24. That's all I knew. was getting high. Well, in many days, I wasn't high. And I never went to drug, drug rehab. I never went to any of that. I went to one AA meeting. I'll never forget this guy named John. He stood up. He said, hi, my name is John. And then he said, and I'm out in the hall. And then he said, I've been sober for 25 years. At that time, I was 24. I said, wait a minute. He's been, he been sober longer than I've been living. And he's still saying he's out in the hall. I, I didn't even know this biblical principle at the time, but it resonated in my spirit. I said, well, if he keeps saying it, that's what he'll always be. <coughs> so here's what I did. I went and found out what God said. God said, I was a new creature in Christ Jesus. God said, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. God said that 
uh, 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 if he has begun, he who's begun a good work in you, he shall bring it to completion to the very day of Christ. So here's what happened, God. Even though in my in my process to maturity, okay. I was still dipping in that. Yeah. yeah, I was still dipping yeah. in that. Yeah. I'd be on my way getting high. Quoting scripture. Listen, <laughs> 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 man, listen. Did you get baptized? Are you out here again? Yep. But he didn't begin to work. I kept speaking the word to my issue. Yeah. Right. Until not my discipline brought me deliverance, till the word brought me deliverance. See, many of us, we gave up on the word. We gave up on it. We, we like hearing it. We like utilizing it as a framework for our moral value and belief system, but we've given up on its power to really produce in our lives. If we're going to have victory, we've got to come back to having confidence in that word. And grafted, Peter said, received with meekness, the engrafted word. Any horticulturists in here? I ain't think so. <laughs> so what do they do if they want to, want to make a red apple produce green apples? They'll take a branch from a green apple tree and they'll make a precise incision cut into the red apple tree. And they'll insert that branch in there. Then they tie it up and bind it up. I ain't going to try to act like I know all what they do. But they put it in there. <laughs> and then over a period of time, what happens? That green branch begins to draw its life from that red branch, and now actually, a red apple tree produces green apples. It's been engrafted. And what the word is saying to us, that God wants us to graft that word to the point where we draw our life from it. We draw our life from it. Not what we have, not what we've done, not what we've accomplished, not what our titles are, but we draw our life from that word. We draw our life from that word. And that's the first strategic point we need to understand if we're going to gain victory in this daily battle over the flesh. Jesus said again, he said, the words I have spoken to you, they are spirit and they are life. It's not doctrine. It's not theology. It's not just a way for us to differentiate our moral dispositions from those others. Jesus said they are spirit and they are life. Second thing we have to do, we have to engraft the word. Next, we have to engraft the reality of being in Christ. We have to engraft the reality of it. What does it mean to be saved? What does it mean? Look, 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 look at what, what, what Paul writes here in Romans 6. And this is the verse I use to find deliverance for myself. Romans 6 follows a long discourse in chapter 3, chapter 4, and chapter 5 about grace. And we come out of chapter 5, and Paul says, we're sin about <coughs> grace even much more about And then he comes into chapter 6 and he says, but there's a question. So what shall I say then? Shall I continue in sin? That grace may abound. Hey, 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 listen, Paul. You said, well, hey, we're, we're sin abounds. Grace does more abounds. So listen, if I want more grace, does it make sense that I do more sin? That's the question. Shall I continue in sin that grace may abound? Paul says, no way, Jose. God forbid. Right? And then he lays out this doctrinal position for us. He says, know ye not. And that's important. His answer to the question of what do I do? with embedded sin. What, what do I do? He starts with this. He says, you need to know something. He says, no, you're not. Or don't you know? Somebody says, don't you realize? Oftentimes, we look for, <laughs> say it this way, we don't have the proper appreciation for the simplistic value of truth. Paul is not going to lay out seven steps for deliverance. Paul is going to lay out positional truth. Because we've lost the reality and the appreciation that truth is its own application. And so Paul says this. You need to know some stuff. 
He says, know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in the newness of life. Paul said, you need to understand something. You died. That when you and I said yes to Jesus, when you and I birthed faith in our heart towards what Jesus did on the cross, not when we decided to join the church, not when we decided we was going to get God to kind of help us out of our problems, when we said yes to the redemptive work that Jesus did on the cross, here's what happened. We were baptized into Jesus' death. So when Christ died on that cross, by carriage, then you and I died on that cross. We were hung up there. When he died, we died. Then it says we are buried with him by baptism into death. So when he was buried for those three days and three nights, spiritually, supernaturally, the moment we said yes to Jesus, we were identified and baptized into his death as well. So not only were we crucified, but we died. Your old man, your old life, that's why the scripture says if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Because we die. It's an important reality for us. Because too many times we see ourselves by ourselves. We keep seeing ourselves by the actions of our flesh, even after coming into Christ. We keep evaluating ourselves and judging ourselves and perceiving ourselves by what our flesh does. But Paul is reminding us, he said, listen, you died. Yeah. Watch this. And you were baptized into his death. For what purpose? That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we, you and I, should walk in what? And what is the newness of life? It's the ability to live life <coughs> above and beyond the power, the pull, the influence, and the control of our flesh. That's who you and I are in Christ. When he died, we died. Watch this. Watch this next verse. Now he says, what does all this mean? What's the implication of all this? He says, for if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death. So we're with him. And we're planted with him in the likeness of his death. Watch this. We shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. So with the same power that Jesus rose, that same power we rose with. That same resurrection power is operating in you and I today. It ain't just for Easter. Look at somebody, tell them. This ain't Easter, man. It's every day. Every day. Watch this now. And then watch this phrase. Again, he says, no one. He comes back to being certain and secure and your knowledge and an understanding of truth. He says, knowing this, that our old man is what? Crucified. Crucified with him. Watch this. Our old man. What died on that cross with Jesus? Our old man. Who's our old man? Our carnal nature. But you say, wait a minute, Dave. If our old man was crucified with him, then why are you telling me that I still got to wrestle or struggle with him every day? Good question, right? I'd be asking that question if I was in your shoe. He says, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, watch this, that the body of sin might be what? Destroyed. That henceforth we should not serve sin. That the body of sin might be destroyed. We're trying to understand strategies for overcoming the daily battle with our flesh. It begins with the grafting the word. It begins with understanding and engrafting, making it a part of something that we live out from who we are in Christ. And the scriptures are telling us when Jesus was crucified and buried and resurrected, you and I were identified and baptized and immersed into that. And the result of that is that our old nature, which ruled and dominated and dictated to us. See, before we got saved, when the flesh said, let's do this. Guess what we did? He is in balls. <laughs> he is in balls. Right? That's why Paul said, before we got saved, the stuff that we didn't want to do, we found ourselves doing. He said, now if I do the stuff that I don't want to do, 
And the stuff that I do want to do, I can't even find the strength to do it. It ain't me no more. It's sin. So what was crucified was that old nature. It was laid upon the cross. Right? Now watch. That the body of sin might be destroyed. That word destroyed is deceiving on the surface because of the way in our American context we look at that word. In our American context, if something is destroyed, I mean, it's done. No more residue, no more impact, no effect. But the Greek use of that word destroyed doesn't mean that it's completely gone away. It means that its function has been altered. See, before we got saved, our spirit man was dead in trespasses and sin. Because we're a threefold, threefold being, right? We have spirit, soul, and body. So before we got saved, our spirit man, dead in trespasses and sin. He ain't even in the game. Right? So we got our soul, our mind, our will, and our emotions. It's the agency of action and release in our life. And our flesh, nothing to hinder, nothing to limit, nothing to stop its influence. So our flesh dominated our soul. It told our mind, it told our will, it told our emotions what to do, when to do it, and how to do it. It wasn't you. The lie of the flesh and the lie of the devil is to get us to think that we are our actions. That we are the dirt we did. Nope, that was your flesh. Influencing your mind, your will, and your emotions. When you got born again, here's what happened. Your spirit man kicked in the game. Yeah. Hey, I'm almost done already. I'm just getting started. <laughs> <laughs> Your spirit man kicked into the game. Now, right? Because before it was it was it was two against two against one. You didn't have a shot. Yeah. Nothing, nothing, nothing to stop your flesh, and it influenced your soul. You didn't have a shot. When you got born again, your spirit man kicks into the game now. But now here's what you have to do. You have to train and condition your soul to now partner and respond to the spirit. That's not going to happen automatically. But the influence of your flesh has been checked. It no longer has dominion and authority and the legal right to say to your soul, let's do this. And the soul says, yes, I'm born. Now, if we choose to yield to sin, and that's the last part of this verse that he says, <clears throat> that we should not do what? Serve. That we should not serve sin. We served sin before because we were slaves and we didn't have a choice. Right. And again, remember, lust and sin is nothing more than the flesh, our carnal nature, trying to fulfill desires given to it by God by means and ways unprescribed by God. <laughs> So now, what has been destroyed is the authority of your flesh. Your flesh no longer has authority over you. So when I discovered that my drug addiction habit no longer had authority over me, that when it said, come on, man, hit this. Come on, man, let's go smoke this. Come on, man, let's go do this. I ain't got to. Like, that sounds crazy, right? That's how you got to talk to that thing. Because it's talking to you. You can be as sophisticated as you want. But you were going right down that path. But you better start talking. Come on now. We ain't got to do that. That ain't me. That's, that's, that's you, flesh. That ain't me. You want to do that. I don't want to do that. And then you, then you learn to take the word and start giving your flesh the word. And so I memorized Romans chapter 6 just for that. What shall I say then? So David continued the sin of getting high, so that grace may abound. God forbid. How so David, who was dead to sin, living in one year in? And you just got to start talking to that thing. Right. Find out what your stuff is. Put your name yes. and put your dirt in there. And start speaking to that thing Amen. every time. Because it doesn't have any authority over you Glory. anymore. It has been destroyed so that you don't have to serve it anymore. Glory. But if you don't understand who you are in Christ, you don't understand your position, you don't understand your authority. You don't understand what you've been delivered into and delivered from. You'll think that that thought is yours. That's right. It ain't yours. Amen. Your spirit man. Amen. Your God man. You're a new creature in Christ Jesus. The essence of who you are has been radically altered and changed forever. You are not what your flesh desires. 
Amen. You were not <coughs> what your flesh lusts for. Stop owning it. Glory. Stop saying, yeah, man, I had to know. You ain't had to know. Your flesh had to know. Glory. And he was trying to get your soul, your mind, your will, and your emotions yes. to embrace it. Yes. Yes. But then we have to learn to take our mind, our will, and our emotions and turn it towards the spirit. Glory. That's what it means to walk in the spirit. Amen. For many of us, in the environments that we've come out of, we thought that walking in the spirit meant walking around condition, the himity, 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 all this, all this extra super, you know, all this hype. And, and listen, that's my foundation. That's where I come from. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not throwing that out. I'm trying to bring some balance and perspective to it. That what it really means to walk in the spirit is that I have the capacity to understand how to make my soul, my mind, my will, and my emotions walk and partner in harmony with the spirit. Because my spirit man isn't the issue. Right. Your spirit man always wants to obey God. That's right. right. Your spirit man never says, well, let me think about that. That's right. 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 <laughs> That's not how we do. Yeah. I do it. Yeah. I'm wrestling now with something I know God said me, do I want to do it? Right. And so we, we, we be like, oh, God. Yeah. We start weighing out. Mm. Yeah. And, and listen, it's real talk here, right? <laughs> and, and sometimes, what do we do? We say, well, I'll pay the price for for a beat. Yeah. <laughs> I ain't gonna do it. I, I take it. I take it. Right? Yeah. Yeah. But it's 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 if we want to have victory over our flesh. It starts with that word. Getting down in us, and then seeing our identity from the reality and power of that. And then realizing who we are in Christ. What our position and authority is with Christ. Because the Bible says that we're what? Seated <coughs> in heavenly places yes. with Christ Jesus. Yes. The Bible says that we are the head and not the tail. The Bible says that we are blessed with all. All. <coughs> blessings. In Christ Jesus. All. You ain't deficient. I don't care what your natural circumstances look like or say. You ain't I don't care what your bank account says. I don't care what your home situation says. The Bible says that you and I have been blessed with what? All. And we have to see ourselves from that positional reality. And we have to live out from that. We have to respond to, to the realities and pressures of life from that position. Not acting as if we are bankrupt and devoid of capacity and resources. Yes. But we have all. Oh. So when your flesh starts whispering to you, when them flashbacks start coming, anybody ever had them flashbacks? Amen. Oh yeah. Amen. Trying to take it down memory lane. Oh, yeah. Listen, and many of us, we took that ride. Mm -hmm. The flesh, listen, the flashback bus came along. <laughs> right, on. right on. Let's take a ride. <laughs> Now we have to, now, now we've got to be able to say, no, that's not my bus. Or to be able to recognize when you get because I'm not trying to go where this takes. Because I'm going to reap whatever I live out. Let me say that again. I'm, I'm going to reap whatever I live out. And the, 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 the scary, dangerous thing about Religion is religion causes us to make contracts and negotiate deals of passivity with our flesh. Religion says, listen, spirit man, soul, flesh, come on. Let's make a deal. You're gonna mess with him in this area, he ain't gonna mess with you in that area. You good? Yeah, I'm good. You good? Okay, I'm good. And that's how we live our lives as Christians. And that's why our lives don't go forward. And, and that's why we can embrace and hold on to things as Christians that we know are inconsistent with who we are. And that's why I, I, I need to say this with wisdom and help. And, 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 and that is why we feel more comfortable 
around carnal Christians, mm -hmm. Christians who are living out of their carnal nature, mm -hmm. than we do Christians who are living out of their spiritual identity. Mm -hmm. We are more comfortable with them because we can relate more to them than we are with those who are truly living by the Spirit. I'm not talking about the crazy ones. I ain't talking about them. Every time you turn around, they got a dream, they got a vision. They got, I ain't talking about them. I ain't talking about them. Be, 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 because, because we have negotiated passivity and compromise with our flesh. And we've learned to live one foot in and one foot out. And we've carved out space for our flesh. We have to grasp the reality of who we are in Christ. I'll hit you with this and we'll stop here. We'll say, we'll, 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 that was just number two. We got seven. We'll come back next week. Next principle I want to leave you with is this. We have to realize that the flesh can only produce death. The flesh can only produce death. Romans 8.13 tells us it very clearly. For if you live after the flesh, live after the flesh. In other words, if you keep yielding to what no longer has authority over you, that's what it means to live after the flesh. Yeah. Allowing our carnal nature to drive and dictate to us how we will satisfy the God-given desires that we've been given. So we allow the flesh to tell us to fulfill our needs in ways other than what God has prescribed. That's what it means to live after the flesh. Because that's why it's so deceiving. Because we're, we're, we're fulfilling things that are in us. And that's why it becomes, again, so deceiving. But it's the means in which we fulfill. Let me give you, let me give you this example. Because I'm always... I'm, Maybe it's because we're my, my, my four and a half years down in Philly. I'm always uncomfortable talking about money. But God's original plan and purpose for you and I in providing for our physical needs was we would look to him. He put Adam in the garden and he said to Adam, he said, Adam, listen all these fruit bearing trees, they're all yours. So everything Adam needed for substance, God provided in that garden, right? Mm -hmm. Now, when you pick something from a tree, where do you reach? Uh, up. So when God created man, he intended man to reach out. As symbolically acknowledging dependence on God. Mm -hmm. For what he needed. When Adam and Eve sinned and they got kicked out of the garden, what was the consequence? God, God said to Adam, said, Adam, listen, the earth ain't gonna just yield the stuff up to you anymore. He said, You're gonna have to work that ground. You're gonna have to toil that ground. Watch this. He said, and by the sweat of your brow, you have to provide for yourself. By the sweat of your brow. So Adam went, man went from to reaching down. We get born again. We're restored back to that original position of Adam. We're restored back to a position where our provision is resourced by. But the flesh will tell us. See, because the way that we acknowledge our dependence upon God and reaching up is how? It's called the top. It's called sowing seed. But the flesh says, because if you live after the flesh, you shall die. If you follow its direction and guidance and how you go about meeting God-given needs and desires, it will produce death, spiritual death, disconnection from God. Saved, but disconnected from God. Mm -hmm. So the flesh says, don't reach out. Get that 
tell you, you need that 10%. Like, ah! God don't really need your money. And he don't. It's the acknowledgement. But then when we don't do the acknowledgement, what, what are we stuck with? And because we're stuck with this, instead of 40 hours a week, we're doing 60 hours a week, 70 hours a week, we work on weekends, we're doing everything we can, and then still at the end of the day, we still ain't got enough to do. If you live after the flesh. Now, I'm not talking about not being committed to your career and all that other stuff. And that's what I'm talking about. Just, just grasp the principle of that. I wanted to use that just as an illustration for us. <clears throat> Living after the flesh is allowing your flesh to direct you in ways to fulfill the God-given desires that he put in you through means and ways that God has not prescribed. And the scripture says that will produce in us death. So, we're gonna hang up. We're gonna hang it up here. You got a battle. Yeah. Battle within. Your key to success in your life, the ability to move into everything that God has purposed and called for you to do. And that's where you find the real contentment and joy and satisfaction. Because many of us, you know, we're at the age in life now we know it don't come from stuff. Right, we, we, it's, it's, it's about finding significance. It's about finding that satisfaction, that, that peace in our heart. If you want that, my encouragement to you is become committed to daily fighting that battle and utilizing the resources that God has made available to us. It begins with engrafting that word. Before you even go to bed tonight, open your Bible. Today is so easy because you just Google stuff today. And just find out. Scriptures, promises, statements of authority, doctrinal truths related to what it is you're struggling with. How many people here struggle with something? There you go. Didn't that feel good? Didn't that feel liberating just to be able to say that? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm, 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 didn't that feel liberating? I'm on a journey. I ain't arrived. I'm on my journey. Ain't nobody arrived. Listen, I've, I've been with Bill Winston. I, I've, I've been with all of them. I, just listen, everybody is yeah. human. That's right. Everybody got issues. That's right. Everybody. So if we all know we're struggling, and how many people want deliverance? Like, like real joy, right? No more, no more just like making a fight. No more church. I can't stand church. No more church for church's sake. And here's what, here's what I encourage you to do. This week, find your positional and scriptural truths targeted towards your ear. Start memorizing them. Right? Start memorizing. Put them on a three by five, five, five card. There used to be something back in the day, um, we don't got so sophisticated with our Christian music nowadays. Um, how many people remember Hosanna Integrity? Right? There's only like seven people. <laughs> How about the Maranatha singers? Yeah. I'm screaming. <laughs> well, they used to have they used to have these things because this is what really helped me. They used to have these um, CDs, uh, well, cassettes, cassettes back then. <laughs> um, scriptural memorization songs. So they would take the scriptures and they would put them. And song. Mm -hmm. And so, remember the old Walkman? Remember, remember them? Yeah. I'd be at work, boy, just, just. Bear it up. <laughs> over and over in my mind. Mm -hmm. Over and over in my mind. 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 Because if I were to say to you that if you set a challenge for yourself to memorize the first 25 verses in chapter 6, your flesh would tell you, you can't do that. That's a lie. <laughs> But if, listen, but, if, but, but if I asked you how many Motown songs you know, <laughs> that's the whole book of Romans. <laughs> right? You know them. Right? You be in the supermarket. They play something from the 70s. You're like, oh, hey, hey, hey. Why? Because it's been engrafted. 
You don't think that's impossible to engraft that? That's all we're talking about doing with the word. And grafting that word. So make it your goal and your target that you are going to begin this year, not with a resolution, but a revolution. You want to overthrow the flesh. You, you break it up in your flesh. You, you just, just, tomorrow morning when you get up, you look in the mirror, you brush your teeth, say, flesh, I quit you. Remember back in the day? Yeah, yeah. I quit you. You ain't my boyfriend no more. You ain't my girlfriend. I quit you. Tell your flesh. You tell somebody right now. Tell somebody right now. I'm breaking up with my flesh. I'm breaking up. We done. We done. We done. We done. I'm telling you guys, if you do, if, listen, if you do this stuff, you'll see breakthroughs. You'll see real, lasting breakthroughs. 